Life Audio. Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hello. Welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we attack our most pervasive fears with truth. Because life is too short for any of us to live enslaved. At Holy Love Ministries, we are passionate about helping God's children discover, embrace, and live in God's freedom. We would love to connect with you online. Just visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want to plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 888-SHARE-19. That's 888-SHARE-19. 888-SHARE-19. The greatest red carpet you'll ever walk is through your front door. We're Dr. Josh and Christy Straub, marriage and leadership coaches and hosts of the Famous at Home podcast. With a realistic, grace-filled look at the struggles families face today, we cover topics designed to help you become a rock star under your roof, set healthy rhythms between work and home, and build a rock-solid marriage. To listen now, go to lifeaudio.com or search Famous at Home on your favorite podcast platform. I'm Jennifer Slattery, and few things have the power to get people riled up to the intensity to to cause arguments and division, quite like religion, because our beliefs in many ways become a part of our identity and that thing that we find security and purpose in. And that's why, in part, a person's faith expressed in practice can create such tension, if not open hostility in families. Jesus told us that his followers would experience opposition from the outside world, and unfortunately, sometimes closer to home in those relationships that we most hold dear. Maybe you know this from experience, or maybe you're afraid that your faith in Christ will cause someone you love to reject you, and that ultimately, you'll find yourself alone. Well, my guest today, Maysu Andrews, understands. Maysu, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Maysu is the Christie Award winning author of Isaiah's Daughter and numerous other novels, including The Pharaoh's Daughter, Miriam, Of Fire and Lions, and Love Amid the Ashes. Her deep understanding of and her love for God's Word brings the biblical world alive for readers. She lives in North Carolina with her husband, Roy, and she enjoys spending time with her growing tribe of grandchildren. Well, reading that, it's obvious your faith is pretty public. I mean, you write biblical fiction. Yeah, it's right there in black and white. And it's pretty much soaked in everything I do. And it would be a hard thing to hide. Yeah. So has that ever, have you ever feared that your openness regarding your love for Jesus, that it would lead to rejection? Oh, absolutely. It, you know, I'm like so many others. It's the same thing. When I'm at the grocery, I see an opportunity to share Jesus and I still have that little, oh, it's that fear of rejection. It's that fear of, oh, are they going to get angry if I say the name Jesus? Are they going to reject me? I still have that same fear. And I, you know, I'm almost 60 years old. I've been a Christian since I was 20, 40 years in that same fear of rejection. We have family still who they don't want to talk about religion and they don't want to talk about God. They don't want anything to do with our faith. And holidays, we've we've just come through some holidays. And holidays, I always wondered why my parents got so tense around the holidays. As a little kid, you know, you can't wait for Christmas. Oh, and the parents would groan. Oh, we got to go to another dinner, you know. 
And I never could understand. Well, then I got to be a grown up. And now I know this tension of, you know, all those, all that baggage at the holidays, because a lot of things go on and it's baggage because of all those arguments about what do you believe? Well, that's not what I believe. Well, then you're attacking who I am because I am what I believe in many ways. And it it becomes a part of my person. Mm -hmm. So have you ever had feared like that would impact, maybe lead to rejection in your family? Oh, I've seen it lead to rejection in my family. So uh, let me back up and and tell you a little bit about my backgrounds. I'm definitely a spiritual mutt. So my mom was charismatic. My dad was Quaker, polar ends of the Christian spectrum. My grandparents were both grandma and grandpa ordained ministers in Pilgrim Holiness Church, long hair, long dresses, and then moved to the Wesleyan faith, then to Nazareth. I mean, we were all over the Christian evangelical spectrum. And dinners became the battleground and scripture the weapon, you know. And as a kid, I remember God and the Bible being this battleground. And it was such a divisive topic that by the time I was 13, I wanted nothing to do with God. And I was I was pretty smart and pretty manipulative. And I found a way that I did not have to go to church with anybody because I I turned them against each other so that I got out of all of it. And by the time I was 16, I was an alcoholic. I didn't want anything to do with any of them. And they pretty much didn't want anything to do with each other. And it nearly caused my parents to divorce. Now, they were of the generation that would have brought more shame than so they stayed together. And that in itself was hard because the divisiveness remained and the aloneness in the home remained. And so Though they were together, they were still very much alone. And a lot of it was because of religion and God. And I saw that and the anger just welled and welled. So take that sick, very angry 16 year old and got into a lot of things I shouldn't have. Right. And got into college and thought had life by the tail and had dated a guy for five years. I thought we were going to get married. He decided we weren't. And ouch. Yep. Ouch. And now what? Now where do I turn? Because I've alienated myself from my family, wanted nothing to do with them. But now I have to come back to my family and I still don't want anything to do with their God. So I get connected with a guy from high school. I'm in college. And my best friend says, well, let's go to a football game. And she says he is back from a year at college. His scholarship dried up and he's a little weird because when he went down to Texas, he got religion. And I'm like, not a big deal. I can deal with religion. Been dealing with it all my life. I can handle it. He shows up to go to a football game in a tie. And I'm thinking, what did those Baptists do to you? I am so sorry. And he's like, no, I, I'm good. I'm really good. And I'm like, yeah, OK, we'll see. That night, I mean, this guy, I had known him since third grade. And he was hot tempered, foul mouthed jock. And we got along so well. <laughs> that sounds funny. <laughs> right? Right. Until it, until those Baptists got him. And I just thought they have brainwashed you. You snap out of it, man. What is wrong with you? And he's like, no, this is who I am now. I know Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, no. So I agreed to go out on a second date with him just to see if he could pull it off again. <laughs> this can't be real, right? I've not no way. I, I've grown up with this all my life. It's not real. So the second date comes around and lo and behold, he did it again. And now I'm mad because I'm thinking, I mean, I knew he was pretty good at this kind of thing. But so I went out with him a third time. <laughs> and now I'm like starting to get a little creeped out because I'm thinking, what if it really is real? And what I've seen in my family and all that fighting, they're really fighting for something they believed in. And now I don't know which one of them is right. And then I saw, I, I started, I went out for more dates. <laughs> and so <laughs> by, by the third, by the, about three weeks in, I accepted this Jesus that I saw had really changed him. Wow. 
And I, the next morning, I'm dumping bottles of Jack Daniels down my mom's drain, mom and dad's drain in the utility room, laundry room. And they're standing there, you know, jaws drop because they had no idea I had all that hidden in my room. <laughs> so they're like, what is going on? And I'm like, I met Roy's Jesus. Wow. It has nothing to do with you, but I met Roy's Jesus. And they were kind of, okay, good, yay. But there's that fear of letting go of a foundation of, I'm, I was raised in a Christian home, but I needed to let go of that and yet build a Christian faith that I saw was real, but I had no idea what to do with it and, and how to build it. And really, Roy, he'd been at a Christian college for nine months, but that was it. And his family had never been to church. He'd gone to church twice as a little kid and gotten kicked out both times. Wow. So you both had spiritual wounds, probably. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, so what do we do now? And so six months later, we got married. Nine months, two weeks later, we had a child. So we were like, you know, let's just have a new life, right? So there you go. You're, we're trying to build a new spiritual foundation, a new spiritual family, and let go of some of the spiritual baggage. And yet we're learning that we also have to forgive. You know, so how do you do that? How do you hold on to family and not ostracize, but love and still maintain those relationships, but nurture the family relationships that are really healthy. So, and build a family here on earth too, that is going to nourish your soul. Wow. And I think, you know, just taking time to kind of process and separate like their ugly behavior is not the gospel, right? Like kind of separating out. I loved how you said like his Jesus and and it really reminds me that we do every day, we demonstrate our hearts. We reveal really what's in our hearts. And so, you know, I'm thinking when you're when you're sharing your story, we, we've been at Faith Over Fear, we've been talking about Abraham, sometimes mm-hmm. called Abraham. And, you know, just to paraphrase for those who maybe aren't familiar with his story. So he left a really a metropolis, a pagan area. And with his family, he lost his father. His, his father had died. Scripture tells us his father died. He had betrayed and abandoned his wife in a huge way that I have to believe caused long lasting distrust and just cracks in their relationship. And then in Genesis chapter 13, so right after his betrayal to his wife, after this huge marital mess up, his servants and his nephew servants, so they're all traveling together as one clan. Well, they started to quarrel over the land. And I'm wondering, as I'm kind of thinking of your story and how relating it maybe to Abraham's story, just of what maybe he experienced was going through and thinking about all the relationship wounds. Some he caused some that just were life, you know, losing his dad. And I wonder how that impacted him going forward. And so we go into Genesis 13 and he ends up giving his nephew like, hey, you choose the best portion of the land. And then we get to Genesis chapter 14 directly after. And and so there's this just this big five kingdoms are fighting against four kingdoms and he's not really involved. But then he, they kind of loop him in because they capture his nephew and all of his nephew's belongings. And and I would love if you could read a section from that, maybe give us a little bit of because I know you've studied his life very intensely. Give us a little bit of a picture of that and then read a portion of that scripture for us. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan, double MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 888-SHARE-19. That's 888-SHARE-19. 
888-SHARE-19. Hi, I'm Beckett Cook, host of The Beckett Cook Show. I lived as a gay man in Hollywood for many, many years until I had a radical encounter with Jesus 13 years ago. Since then, I've gotten my master's degree in seminary and published a book called A Change of Affection. On my podcast, The Becca Cook Show, I sit down with fascinating Christian scholars and thinkers to address the lies of the culture and bring the biblical truth to bear on those lies. To start listening now, go to lifeaudio.com or search for The Becca Cook Show on your favorite podcasting platform. Okay. Well, let me give just a teeny bit of background on the five kingdoms and four kingdoms because I think that will help us understand a little bit more about Abram's family. So at the beginning of chapter 14, it says at that time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, Shinar is Babylon. And that's actually back in the area where Abram and his dad and Lot and Sarai actually came from. So it was those four kings, they were kings from family area. They were tribal kings from where Abram and Sarai and and all of them actually came from. So they were foundational people from the same tribes of Shem, Noah's son Shem, where Abram and them were. They were the ones who came into Canaan and attacked Sodom, the five kings that had banded together. So When the person from Sodom came, escaped, and told Abram that Lot had been taken, he was actually saying, we want you to come and fight against the kings of your old tribes, your ancestors' tribes, basically. And so Abram would have been, I, I think, a little bit torn here because if you go back in time, And you remember when Noah came off the ark and all of that, Shem's lineage was blessed. And they're the ones that continued to tell the stories that we have in the Bible today. But Abram would have had to have made a choice there to fight against that lineage to rescue Lot, who had chosen to live among the Canaanites and to live among the sinful Canaanites. Where Abram, when he lived among the Canaanites, he still lived in the hill country where there weren't a lot of people. And in what I'm about to read to you, notice that Abram is the one who influences the people he lives with, not the other way around. So let me read these verses to you. It's chapter 14, verses 11 through 16. That's where I'm going to read. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. Notice it says they were allied with Abram, not Abram was allied with them, but they were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. This is Abram (laughs) with 318 men and these allied Amorites. Pursuing four kingdoms, an army of four kingdoms, because they've stolen his nephew Lot from Canaanites, where he should not have been anyway, but he took the best land, even though it was more dangerous because it was among a whole lot of people. And Abraham knew he probably shouldn't have, but he did. And now Abram is deciding to go get his family out of the mess that they're in, right? So then it says during the night, Verse 15, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. So I think it's what that says to me is that Abram had formed his family. He was steady. He was confident in who his family was. His family was Sarai. His family 
was the 318 men, trained men, born in his family. His family was Mamre and Eshcol and Ener, who were allied with him. And why were they his family? Because he trusted that the God who had called him into a foreign land had made them his family. And because God was his family. And so it didn't matter as much his roots as the connection and and the tree where he was growing and the fruit of that tree. That's what mattered most to Abram in his family relationship, I think. You know, I love your focus on, you know, God being his family and God forming his family and just really trusting him. I think sometimes we forget. So he did give us a need for connection, for deep, deep oh, connection. Connection. And when I'm going through so many of our fears and anxieties result from fears that our needs are not going to get met. And so when I remember that, it's like if I'm dealing with family, we don't know how family will respond. He didn't know how Lot would respond. And we do find out later Lot, you know, wasn't always, didn't always make the best decisions. We don't know how people will respond, but, and we might even respond, like, like I'd said before, Abram made some, some hugely big mistakes in Genesis 12. That he could have camped out in like, okay, I'm it's, I'm over, I'm done, I messed up, I forfeited God's faithfulness. Or in this section, he could be like, okay, God's faithfulness, they're going to, these kings are going to overpower God's faithfulness, which makes God's faithfulness dependent on people, right? Whether it's himself or it's others. And if we can kind of unpack that and recognize God's faithfulness is not dependent on ours, and if he planted a need within us, he has promised to meet those needs. And so I really love your emphasis on that. And I also love, I think sometimes when we deal with family, you talked about in your story, we bring all of this baggage. We have this history, good and bad, and we have wounds and we have triggers. And I love seeing in this passage, just he was strategic and thoughtful. And I think we can become overly emotional, which is what sounds like your parents did, right? You said they used scripture as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were in their brain thinking, okay, I need to do it this way. Whereas I kind of, when I read Abram's story, I'm reminded I have best results when I take a pause and I'm like, okay, Lord, how are you wanting me to proceed in this situation? Yeah. And, and I think we see that strategy in that he took 318 men. I mean, I love it when the Bible gives us specific you know, and and I sit up and listen. I mean, when it gives you that kind of specific. So when Jesus was raised from the dead and the fish and the disciples go out and fish and they haven't caught anything. And then Jesus is like, oh, yo, go over there and throw the net over. And it tells us he caught. I forget the number, but I should remember that. But it's like 154 fish. Wow. Okay, let's pay attention to how many fish, because if it's telling you the number of fish, we ought to be paying attention to that. Okay. Abraham took 318 men. We need to realize that God wants us. There are so many details that the Bible leaves out. Let's pay attention when it gives us detail. So he took 318 men to fight for kingdoms. That's a big deal. Yes, yes. He waited and attacked them at night. Yes. That's a big deal. They fought from Dan to Damascus. That is a very long way. And we, our hearts are a big deal. And these people were real people and they lived this. And just like our families really hurt us sometimes. And I really hurt my family sometimes. And I'm really terrified that sometimes... Are those wounds going to heal? Mm. Am I going to be able to reconcile that relationship or is it damaged beyond reconciliation? I'm so grateful that the family relationships, this is one thing that I hold on to. I am so determined that my family relationships, that I'm, I'm going to be able to see them in eternity because if I can know that, then I can know that I will have them in eternity and we will be reconciled. So as long as I can know that, 
even if there is baggage between us, even if there is stuff that can't be fixed on this earth, I can know that in eternity, we will be okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that helps me. Yeah. And he, he will also, God will connect us. And Jesus said, if you lose brothers and sisters and mothers, yeah. that that he will plant us, you know, in a thriving family of God. And I try to remember, so, you know, we're looking at, at Abram's story. And you talked about how he was strategic. He had these men that were already trained and he went at night, but yet he was overpowered. So you see this combination of him doing his part, but trusting God to do his part. Yep. I think if we can step back, whatever we're going through and try to find that balance, remembering that whatever battle we're facing, and we're all in a battle for love versus hate and truth versus deception and light versus dark. So we are in a battle. But I like to remind us all and myself, when we fight our battles God's way, he fight our battles for us. And one thing I'm trying to dip through my brain, because I'm a highly emotive person and, and I can sometimes get, get overly, my emotions can hinder my wisdom, I think I I will say. Yes, and so I'm trying to remind myself as a mom, as a ministry leader, wherever I'm encountering people, I try to ask myself, what is the healthiest and the holiest response? Not not what will make this person happy, not what will alleviate tension, but what is the holiest and healthiest response? I don't always know what that is. Mm -hmm. But with that as my radar, and then, like I said, trusting God to do his part and knowing that if I am choosing holy and healthy, I can be remain walking deeply connected with Jesus Christ and trusting him for the outcome. And then I can walk away with like saying, OK, I did my part. I did the hard right thing. And there's peace in that. Yeah, there is. Here's the thing. You know, I'm going to give you the spoiler. Lot does not go back home with Abram. He saved Lot. At great risk. I at great risk. But Lot doesn't go back home with him. Lot goes back to Sodom for crying out loud. I just want to shake Lot. I just want to say, really, are you kidding me? After that, you go back. But he did. And Abram still goes to bat for him. And so, you know, that just makes me kind of sink inside. But if Abram looked to Lot to make him feel like he had family, he would be disappointed again and again. And deeply wounded. Deeply wounded. And so... I think that is a, a cautionary tale for us in Scripture. Who are we going to look to for our family connections? Abraham had trained 318 men born in his household. They weren't related to him by blood. At that point, he had no children. And Lot was the only blood relation yeah. he had in that moment. And he had just risked everything for him. Mm -hmm. And Lot turns around and goes back to Sodom. And so Abraham, Abram at this point, he he goes back to his hilltop with the 318 men born in his household and three Amorites and to his barren wife. And they are his family. Yeah. If God honors that and blesses. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really great place just to to kind of end our episode with the reminder. We can trust the character of God. We can trust the character and the heart of God. We can trust that his faithfulness is not dependent on ours and that he will meet our need for connection. But we also have to follow his way. And if that means like fighting through our baggage and, and dealing with this, our defensive behaviors and getting healthy, all of those things. Well, Mesu, I first, I, I also want to say, so you have a book on Sarai, I'm sorry, Sarai. And so I think that would be a great for listeners. Oh, it's coming. When does it release? It releases in August through Guideposts. Awesome. Okay. So for those who really want to dig deep, I think there's a lot of faith nuggets we can pull from her life and just that everything she and her husband experienced. I would encourage listeners to watch out for that book coming in August. And what was the title again? We don't have a title yet. Okay. Okay. So we will put Maysu's links in the show notes. So make sure to, to follow her. She's got great, great biblical novels, which can help scripture to come alive in a, in a really vivid way. So I would encourage you to find those. And Maysu, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate you. I appreciate your ministry. What a wonderful ministry. Thank you. Well, to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's episode and that it gave you maybe some action steps or, or at least a heart posture that you can take moving forward into what may be a really painful circumstance or season for you. If you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to subscribe to this podcast. Then you won't miss a single episode. Make sure to rate it. That helps others to find it. And it really encourages our team as well. And share it with your friends through email or on social media. And until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free. 
Faith Over Fear is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Let's see, if something costs less, but people are happier with it, that sounds like something to look into, and that's MediShare. Maybe you've heard switching to MediShare to pay for health care can save the typical family 500 bucks a month, and that's huge. But it's also true that people are way more satisfied after making the switch, too. The customer satisfaction rate for MediShare is double that of the typical health insurance plan. Double. MediShare works. It's been around for more than a quarter century, and members have shared more than $3 billion of each other's bills. People love having telehealth and a huge nationwide PPO network. So, yeah, you can save a ton and like it better. Imagine being happy with how you're taking care of your health care. So if you're self-employed or part of the gig economy or you just want a plan you're happy with, you can call right now and get a price within two minutes. A very, very smart use of two minutes. Here's the number you need. 888-SHARE-19. That's 888-SHARE-19. 888-SHARE-19.